Wise men truly are they of Thessaly, and good reason had they to change their minds in time and consult for their own safety, for to pass by other matters they must have felt that they lived in a country which may easily be brought under and subdued. Nothing more is needed than to turn the river upon their lands by an embankment which should fill up the gorge and force the stream from its present channel, and lo, all Thessaly except the mountains would at once be laid under water. The king aimed in this speech at the sons of Aleus, who were Thessalians, and had been the first of all the Greeks to make submission to him. He thought that they had made their friendly offers in the name of the whole people. So Xerxes, when he had viewed the place and made the above speech, went back to Therma. The stay of Xerxes in Pieria lasted for several days, during which a third part of his army was employed in cutting down the woods on the Macedonian mountain range to give his forces free passage into Perabia. At this time the heralds who had been sent into Greece to require earth for the king returned to the camp, some of them empty-handed, others with earth and water. Among the number of those from whom earth and water were brought were the Thessalians, Dolopians, Enionians, Peribians, Locrians, Magnetians, Malians, Achaeans, and Theotis, Thebans, and Boeotians generally, except those of Plataea and Thespiae. These are the nations against whom the Greeks that had taken up arms to resist the barbarians swore the oath which ran thus, from all those of Greek blood who delivered themselves up to the Persians without necessity when their affairs were in good condition, we will take a tithe of their goods and give it to the god at Delphi. So ran the words of the Greek oath. King Xerxes had sent no heralds either to Athens or Sparta to ask earth and water for a reason which I will now relate. When Darius, some time before, sent messengers for the same purpose, they were thrown at Athens into the pit of punishment, at Sparta into a well, and bidden to take therefrom earth and water for themselves and carry it to their king. On this account Xerxes did not send to ask them. What calamity came upon the Athenians to punish them for their treatment of the heralds, I can't say, unless it were the laying waste of their city and territory, but that, I believe, was not on account of this crime. On the Lacedaemonians, however, the wrath of Talthibius, Agamemnon's herald, fell with violence. Talthibius has a temple at Sparta, and his descendants, who are called Talthibiadi, still live there and have the privilege of being the only persons who discharge the office of herald. When therefore the Spartans had done the deed of which we speak, the victims at their sacrifices failed to give good tokens, and this failure lasted for a very long time. Then the Spartans were troubled, and regarding what had befallen them as a grievous calamity, they held frequent assemblies of the people and made proclamation through the town was any Lacedaemonian willing to give his life for Sparta? Upon this, two Spartans, Sperthias, the son of Aneristus, and Bulis, the son of Nicolaus, both men of noble birth and among the wealthiest in the place, came forward and freely offered themselves as an atonement to Xerxes for the heralds of Darius slain at Sparta. So the Spartans sent them away to the Medes to undergo death. Nor is the courage which these men hereby displayed alone worthy of wonder, but so likewise are the following speeches which were made by them. On their road to Susa, they presented themselves before Hidanes. This Hidanes was a Persian by birth and had the command of all the nations that dwelt along the sea coast of Asia. He accordingly showed them hospitality and invited them to a banquet, where, as they feasted, he said to them, Men of Lacedaemon, why will ye not consent to be friends with the king? Ye have but to look at me and my fortune to see that the king knows well how to honor merit. In like manner ye yourselves, were ye to make your submission to him, would receive at his hands seeing that he deems you men of merit, some government in Greece. 
Hidanis, they answered, thou art a one-sided counsellor. Thou hast experience of half the matter, but the other half is beyond thy knowledge. A slave's life thou understandest, but never having tasted liberty thou canst not tell whether it be sweet or no. Ah, hadst thou known what freedom is, thou wouldst have bidden us fight for it, not with a spear only, but with the battle-axe. So they answered Hidanis. And afterwards, when they were come to Susa into the king's presence, and the guards ordered them to fall down and do obeisance, and went so far as to use force to compel them, they refused, and said they would never do any such thing, even were their heads thrust down to the ground, for it was not their custom to worship men, and they had not come to Persia for that purpose. So they fought off the ceremony, and having done so, addressed the king in words much like the following. O king of the Medes, the Lacedaemonians have sent us hither in the place of those heralds of thine who were slain in Sparta to make atonement to thee on their account. Then Xerxes answered with true greatness of soul that he would not act like the Lacedaemonians who by killing the heralds had broken the laws which all men hold in common. As he had blamed such conduct in them, he would never be guilty of it himself. And besides, he didn't wish by putting the two men to death to free the Lacedaemonians from the stain of their former outrage. This conduct on the part of the Spartans caused the anger of Talthybius to cease for a while, notwithstanding that Spertheus and Bullis returned home alive. But many years afterwards it awoke once more, as the Lacedaemonians themselves declare during the war between the Peloponnesians and the Athenians. In my judgment this was a case wherein the hand of heaven was most plainly manifest, that the wrath of Talthybius should have fallen upon ambassadors and not slacked till it had full vent, so much justice required but that it should have come upon the sons of the very men who were sent up to the Persian king on its account, upon Nicolaus, the son of Bulis, and Enaristus, the son of Spertheus, the same who carried off fishermen from Tyrins when cruising in a well-manned merchant ship, this does seem to me to be plainly a supernatural circumstance. Yet certain it is that these two men, having been sent to Asia as ambassadors by the Lacedaemonians, were betrayed by Sitalkes, the son of Teres, king of Thrace, and Nymphodorus, the son of Pythes, a native of Abdera, and being made prisoners at Byzanthi upon the Hellespont, were conveyed to Attica, and there put to death by the Athenians, at the same time as Aristeus, the son of Adamantus the Corinthian. All this happened, however, many years after the expedition of Xerxes. To return, however, to my main subject, the expedition of the Persian king, though it was in name directed against Athens, threatened really the whole of Greece. And of this the Greeks were aware some time before, but they didn't all view the matter in the same light. Some of them had given the Persian earth and water, and were bold on this account, deeming themselves thereby secured against suffering hurt from the barbarian army while others who had refused compliance were thrown into extreme alarm. For whereas they considered all the ships in Greece too few to engage the enemy, it was plain that the greater number of states would take no part in the war, but warmly favoured the Medes. And here I feel constrained to deliver an opinion, which most men I know will mislike, but which, as it seems to me to be true, I am determined not to withhold. Had the Athenians, from fear of the approaching danger, quitted their country, or had they, without quitting it, submitted to the power of Xerxes, there would certainly have been no attempt to resist the Persians by sea, in which case the course of events by land would have been the following. Though the Peloponnesians might have carried ever so many breastworks across the isthmus, yet their allies would have fallen off from the Lacedaemonians, not by voluntary desertion, but because town after town must have been taken by the fleet of the barbarians, 
and so the Lacedaemonians would at last have stood alone, and standing alone would have displayed prodigies of valour and died nobly. Either they would have done thus, or else before it came to that extremity, seeing one Greek state after another embrace the cause of the Medes, they would have come to terms with King Xerxes, and thus, either way, Greece would have been brought under Persia. But I can't understand of what possible use the walls across the isthmus could have been if the king had had the mastery of the sea. If then a man should now say that the Athenians were the saviors of Greece, he wouldn't exceed the truth, for they truly held the scales, and whichever side they espoused must have carried the day. They too it was who, when they had determined to maintain the freedom of Greece, roused up that portion of the Greek nation which had not gone over to the Medes, and so, next to the gods, they repulsed the invader. Even the terrible oracles which reached them from Delphi and struck fear into their hearts failed to persuade them to fly from Greece. They had the courage to remain faithful to their land and await the coming of the foe. When the Athenians, anxious to consult the oracle, sent their messengers to Delphi, hardly had the envoys completed the customary rites about the sacred precinct and taken their seats inside the sanctuary of the god, when the Pythoness, Aristonice by name, thus prophesied, Wretches, why sit ye here? Fly, fly to the ends of creation, quitting your homes and to the crags which your city crowns with her circlet, Neither the head nor the body is firm in its place, nor at bottom firm the feet, nor the hands, nor resteth the middle uninjured, all, all ruined and lost, since fire and impetuous Ares, speeding along in a Syrian chariot, hastes to destroy her, not alone shalt thou suffer, full many the towers he will level, many the shrines of the gods he will give to a fiery destruction, even now they stand with dark sweat, horribly dripping, trembling and quaking for fear, and lo, from the high roofs trickleth black blood, sign prophetic of hard distresses impending. Get ye away from the temple and brood on the ills that await ye. When the Athenian messengers heard this reply, they were filled with the deepest affliction. Whereupon Timon, the son of Androbulus, one of the men of most mark among the Delphians, seeing how utterly cast down they were at the gloomy prophecy, advised them to take an olive branch and, entering the sanctuary again, consult the oracle as suppliants. The Athenians followed this advice, and going in once more, said, O king, we pray thee reverence these bows of supplication which we bear in our hands, and deliver to us something more comforting concerning our country, else we will not leave thy sanctuary, but will stay here till we die. Upon this the priestess gave them a second answer, which was the following. Pallas has not been able to soften the Lord of Olympus, though she has often prayed him and urged him with excellent counsel, yet once more I address thee in words than adamant firmer. When the foe shall have taken whatever the limit of Kekrops holds within it, and all which divine Kitharan shelters, then far-seeing Zeus grants this to the prayers of Athena. Safe shall be the wooden wall continue for thee and thy children. Wait not the tramp of the horse, nor the footman mightily moving over the land, but turn your back to the foe and retire ye. Yet shall a day arrive when ye shall meet him in battle. Holy Salamis, thou shalt destroy the offspring of women when men scatter the seed and when they gather the harvest. This answer seemed, as indeed it was, gentler than the former one. So the envoys wrote it down and went back with it to Athens. When, however, upon their arrival they produced it before the people and inquiry began to be made into its true meaning, Many and various were the interpretations which men put on it. Two, more especially, seemed to be directly opposed to one another. Certain of the old men were of opinion that the god meant to tell them the citadel would escape. 
but this was anciently defended by a palisade, and they supposed that barrier to be the wooden wall of the oracle. Others maintained that the fleet was what the god pointed at, and their advice was that nothing should be thought of except the ships, which had best be at once got ready. Still such as said the wooden wall meant the fleet were perplexed by the last two lines of the oracle. Holy Salamis, thou shalt destroy the offspring of women, when men scatter the seed, or when they gather the harvest. These words caused great disturbance among those who took the wooden wall to be the ships, since the interpreters understood them to mean that if they made preparations for a sea fight, they would suffer defeat off Salamis. Now there was at Athens a man who had lately made his way into the first rank of citizens. His true name was Themistocles, but he was known more generally as the son of Neocles. This man came forward and said that the interpreters had not explained the oracle together aright. For if, he argued, the clause in question had really respected the Athenians, it would not have been expressed so mildly. The phrase used would have been luckless Salamis rather than holy Salamis, had those to whom the island belonged been about to perish in its neighborhood. Rightly taken, the response of the god threatened the enemy much more than the Athenians. He therefore counseled his countrymen to make ready to fight on board their ships, since they were the wooden wall in which the god told them to trust. When Themistocles had thus cleared the matter, the Athenians embraced his view, preferring it to that of the interpreters. The advice of these last had been against engaging in a sea fight. All the Athenians could do, they said, was, without lifting a hand in their defense, to quit Attica and make a settlement in some other country. Themistocles had before this given a counsel which prevailed very seasonably. The Athenians, having a large sum of money in their treasury, the produce of the mines at Lorium, were about to share it among the full-grown citizens who would have received ten drachmas apiece, when Themistocles persuaded them to forbear the distribution and build with the money two hundred ships to help them in their war against the Aegeanetans. It was the breaking out of the Aegeanetan war which was at this time the saving of Greece, for hereby were the Athenians forced to become a maritime power. The new ships weren't used for the purpose for which they had been built, but became a help to Greece in her hour of need. And the Athenians had not only these vessels ready before the war, but they likewise set to work to build more. While they determined in a council which was held after the debate upon the oracle, that according to the advice of the god they would embark their whole force aboard their ships, and with such Greeks as chose to join them, give battle to the barbarian invader. Such then were the oracles which had been received by the Athenians. The Greeks who were well affected to the Grecian cause, having assembled in one place, and there consulted together, and interchanged pledges with each other, agreed that before any other step was taken, the feuds and enmities which existed between the different nations should first of all be appeased. Many such there were, but one was of more importance than the rest, namely the war which was still going on between the Athenians and the Aegeanetans. When this business was concluded, understanding that Xerxes had reached Sardis with his army, they resolved to dispatch spies into Asia to take note of the king's affairs. At the same time, they determined to send ambassadors to the Argives and conclude a league with them against the Persians, while they likewise dispatched messengers to Galo, the son of Dinomenes in Sicily, to the people of Corsaira, and to those of Crete, exhorting them to send help to Greece. Their wish was to unite, if possible, the entire Greek name in one, and so to bring all to join in the same plan of defense, inasmuch as the approaching dangers threatened all alike. Now the power of Galo was said to be very great, far greater than that of any single Grecian people. So when these resolutions had been agreed upon, and the quarrels between the states made up, First of all, they sent into Asia three men as spies. 
These men reached Sardis and took note of the king's forces, that being discovered were examined by order of the generals who commanded the land army, and having been condemned to suffer death were led out to execution. Xerxes, however, when the news reached him, disapproving the sentence of the generals, sent some of his bodyguard with instructions, if they found the spies still alive, to bring them into his presence. The messengers found the spies alive and brought them before the king, who, when he heard the purpose for which they had come, gave orders to his guards to take them round the camp and show them all the footmen and all the horse letting them gaze at everything to their heart's content. Then, when they were satisfied, to send them away unharmed to whatever country they desired. For these orders, Xerxes gave afterwards the following reasons. Had the spies been put to death, he said, the Greeks would have continued ignorant of the vastness of his army, which surpassed the common report of it, while he would have done them a very small injury by killing three of their men. On the other hand, by the return of the spies to Greece, his power would become known, and the Greeks, he expected, would make surrender of their freedom before he began his march, by which means his troops would be saved all the trouble of an expedition. This reasoning was like to that which he used upon another occasion. While he was staying at Abydos, he saw some corn ships which were passing through the Hellespont from the Euxine on their way to Aegina and the Peloponnese. His attendants, hearing that they were the enemies, were ready to capture them, and looked to see when Xerxes would give the signal. He, however, merely asked whither the ships were bound, and when they answered, For thy foes, master, with corn on board. We too are bound thither, he rejoined, laden, among other things, with corn. What harm is it if they carry our provisions for us? So the spies, when they had seen everything, were dismissed and came back to Europe. The Greeks, who had banded themselves together against the Persian king, after dispatching the spies into Asia, sent next ambassadors to Argos. The account which the Argives give of their own proceedings is the following. They say that they had information from the very first of the preparations which the barbarians were making against Greece, so, as they expected that the Greeks would come upon them for aid against the assailant, they sent envoys to Delphi to inquire of the god what it would be best for them to do in the matter. They had lost, not long before, six thousand citizens who had been slain by the Lacedaemonians under Cleomenes, the son of Anaxandridas, which was the reason why they now sent to Delphi. When the Pythoness heard their question, she replied, Hated of all thy neighbours, beloved of the blessed immortals, sit thou still, with thy lance drawn inward, patiently watching. Warily guard thine head, and the head will take care of the body. This prophecy had been given them some time before the envoys came, but still when they afterwards arrived it was permitted them to enter the council house and there deliver their message. And this answer was returned to their demands. Argos is ready to do as ye require, if the Lacedaemonians will first make a truce for thirty years, and will further divide with Argos the leadership of the allied army. Although in strict right the whole command should be hers, she will be content to have the leadership divided equally. Such, they say, was the reply made by the council, in spite of the oracle which forbade them to enter into a league with the Greeks. For while, not without fear of disobeying the oracle, they were greatly desirous of obtaining a thirty years' truce to give time for their sons to grow to man's estate. They reflected that if no such truce were concluded, and it should be their lot to suffer a second calamity at the hands of the Persians, it was likely they would fall hopelessly under the power of Sparta. But to the demands of the Argive council, the Lacedaemonian envoys made answer, they would bring before the people the question of concluding a truce. With regard to the leadership, they had received orders what to say, and the reply was that Sparta had two kings, Argos but one. It was not possible that either of the two Spartans should be stripped of his dignity, 
but they didn't oppose the Argive king having one vote like each of them. The Argives say that they couldn't brook this arrogance on the part of Sparta, and rather than yield one jot to it, they preferred to be under the rule of the barbarians. So they told the envoys to be gone before sunset from their territory, or they should be treated as enemies. Such is the account which is given of these matters by the Argives themselves. There is another story, which is told generally through Greece, of a different tenor. Xerxes, it said, before he set forth on his expedition against Greece, sent a herald to Argos, who on his arrival spoke as follows. Men of Argos, King Xerxes speaks thus to you. We Persians deem that the Perses, from whom we descend, was the child of Perseus, the son of Danae, and of Andromeda, the daughter of Cepheus. Hereby it would seem that we come of your stock and lineage. So then it neither befits us to make war upon those from whom we spring, nor can it be right for you to fight on behalf of others against us. Your place is to keep quiet and hold yourselves aloof. Only let matters proceed as I wish, and there is no people whom I shall have in higher esteem than you. This address, says the story, was highly valued by the Argives, who therefore at the first neither gave a promise to the Greeks nor yet put forward a demand. Afterwards, however, when the Greeks called upon them to give their aid, they made the claim which has been mentioned because they knew well that the Lacedaemonians would never yield it, and so they would have a pretext for taking no part in the war. Some of the Greeks say that this account agrees remarkably with what happened many years afterwards. Callias, the son of Hipponicus, and certain others with him had gone up to Susa, the city of Memnon, as ambassadors of the Athenians upon a business quite distinct from this. While they were there, it happened that the Argives likewise sent ambassadors to Susa to ask Artaxerxes, the son of Xerxes, if the friendship which they had formed with his father still continued, or if he looked upon them as his enemies. To which King Artaxerxes replied, Most certainly it continues, and there's no city which I reckon more my friend than Argos. For my own part, I can't positively say whether Xerxes did send the herald to Argos or not, nor whether Argive ambassadors at Susa did really put this question to Artaxerxes about the friendship between them and him. Neither do I deliver any opinion hereupon other than that of the Argives themselves. This, however, I know, that if any nation were to bring all its evil deeds to a given place in order to make an exchange with some other nation, when they had all looked carefully at their neighbor's faults, they would be truly glad to carry their own back again. So, after all, the conduct of the Argives was not perhaps more disgraceful than that of others. For myself, my duty is to report all that's said, but I'm not obliged to believe it all alike a remark which may be understood to apply to my whole history. Some even go so far as to say that the Argives first invited the Persians to invade Greece because of their ill success in the war with Lacedaemon, since they preferred anything to the smart of their actual sufferings. Thus much concerning the Argives. Other ambassadors, among whom was Syagoras from Lacedaemon, were sent by the Allies into Sicily, with instructions to confer with Galo. The ancestor of this Galo, who first settled at Gela, was a native of the Isle of Telos, which lies off Triopium. When Galo was colonized by Antiphemus and the Lindians of Rhodes, he likewise took part in the expedition. In course of time, his descendants became the high priests of the gods who dwell below, an office which they held continually from the time that Tellenes, one of Galo's ancestors, obtained it in the way which I will now mention. Certain citizens of Gala, worsted in a sedition, had found a refuge at Mactorium, a town situated on the heights above Gala. Tellenes reinstated these men without any human help, solely by means of the sacred rites of these deities. From whom he received them, or how he himself acquired them, I can't say, but certain it is that relying on their power, 
he brought the exiles back. For this his reward was to be the office of high priest of those gods for himself and his seed forever. It surprises me especially that such a feat should have been performed by Tellini's, for I've always looked upon acts of this nature as beyond the abilities of common men, and only to be a